Con is tea. This is Thurika butting in at the top of the episode with a very quick announcement. We have some upcoming live shows. We are going to be at a new venue called Gaia in Cork on the 23rd of July. And we're going to be back in Whelan's on the 20th of August. Uh, if you would like to come to either of those shows, you can find details and ticket links on our website, candlelittales.ie. And if you are listening to this after the 20th of August, you can find details of whatever show we are doing next at candlelittales.ie. Hope to see you there. Honesty, how are ye? Welcome to the Candle Tales podcast and the final episode in the Waterways series. In this episode, Circa is telling the story of Manon McLear's famous crane bag. Now, this podcast is brought to you by our supporters over on Patreon. You can join them at patreon.com forward slash candle tales or make a one time donation, the PayPal button on our website. Like, share, comment, subscribe, all of the above. Most importantly, enjoy. But for now, hey, Circa, tell us the story, will you? The Crane Bag This island, like any island, has one great waterway that surrounds it and holds it. Nestled into the heart of it, like an emerald in a field of lapis. To walk far enough in any direction is to come to the sea. Be it cliff or beach or mouth of river, the ocean surrounds. And the ocean is both generous and cruel. It can give so much life and livelihood, food and travel and resources beyond measure, treasures overflowing silver and gold, and it can take just as quickly, just as fiercely. By long tradition, the fishermen of this island never learned to swim. For the sea gives, and the sea takes its own. And to struggle against that is mere hubris. By tradition longer still, the king of the sea is hailed was Mananon MacLear. Mananon's power, like the power of the sea, is vast. Some say he is older even than the Tuatha de Danann. Some say it was Mananon, at the Battle of Taltu, shaking his cloak between the Tuatha de Danann and the Sons of Mill, who first created the other world. Before that time there was no place just alongside this place and after that time there was a refuge for the two of the for the magic of the world for those who were lost and gone before us a place beside and underneath There are those who say that he lives on an island in between the two great islands of Ireland and Great Britain, the Isle of Man named after him. And there are those who say that he rides his chariot over the waves, seeing them not as waves but as meadows filled with flowers. And to him the fish are cattle and sheep. And he can walk as easily on the water as he can on the land. He makes no distinction between the two. And Mananon is wise. 
and Mananon sometimes leads a king astray into the other world to teach him. Sometimes Mananon plays tricks for his own ends. Sometimes he is careless and sometimes he is foolish. Sometimes he is capricious. Because his nature is the nature of the sea. Generous and kind and thoughtless and cruel. By changing tides and changing weather. And Mananon had a son. His son Ilbrek. Sensitive. Beautiful. A poet. And when Ilbrek grew to manhood... There were two women of the Tuatha Dé Danann who fell in love with him. Now the love of a woman of the Tuatha Dé Danann is an extraordinary gift. It is huge and overwhelming. Sometimes cruel and capricious. Aoife, the daughter of Delbeth, loved Ilbrek like the sun in summer. She loved him with a warmth and a heat and a desire. There was fire and comfort all at the same time that overflowed from her. She could not hide it even if she tried. For when Ilbrek walked into a room, her face beamed like sunshine. And Luacra, daughter of Avertuk, she loved Ilbrek no less fiercely. Her love for him was like a great wave that would sweep up over him and drag him down, down to beautiful depths from which he would never escape, would steal his breath from his lungs would steal the eyes out of every face that gazed upon him that was not her. Lucra wanted Ilbrek for her own. And Lucra noticed the love that Aoife, daughter of Delbeth, had for Ilbrek, son of Mananon. It was plain to see how Aoife lit up and beamed when Ilbrek walked into a room. And then one day, she noticed that when Aoife lit up, Ilbrek did too. And that to Lucra was the cruelest thing, that he might love another when she loved him so much, when her love for him was so overwhelming, it stole her own breath away that he might turn his face from her and love another. The jealousy rose up in her like a tide, and because she was one of the two of the Danon, her mood made itself manifest. And what came out of her was hatred, not for Ilbrek, but for Aoife, her rival. The magic of Lucra was instinctive and it was cruel. And it came at Aoife unstoppable as the waves of the ocean. Now Aoife was a creature of sunlight and airiness and laughter and lightness. Aoife was beautiful and Aoife was graceful. So the magic of Lulkra, when it touched her, it touched her core and drew forth from her that shape that she was kin to already. And Aoife, defenceless against the cruelty and jealousy of Lulkra, was transformed into a bird, into a crane. Long-legged and long-necked, 
graceful, stalking, flying with the legs out behind her. Aoife found herself in this new body. And she fled. For safety, she fled to the lands of Mananon MacLear. Now when Mananon found her, he recognised her. He was able to see when she came close that this was the woman who loved his son, who his son had started to love in return. And Mananon was heartbroken, furious, grieving, devastated to see what had become of Aoife, who he had hoped to welcome as daughter-in-law. And he took her under his protection and he told her as long as she stayed in his lands, she had nothing and no one to fear. But even his magic, vast as it was, deep as it was, could not counter the magic of another. Lucra's spell would stay. Elbrek, Mananon's son, could not accept this. He too was furious and he too was devastated. But he could not accept his father's powerlessness. His father who was so powerful to set so much in the world to rights, if he wanted to, was part of Elbrek who did not quite believe that this was beyond his father's power. His father who created the other world. His father who walked on the waves as easily as I might walk in a meadow. And Ilbrek could not bear to look on Aoife in this form. And so he left. He left to wander the roads of Ireland. He left to sing his sad songs in the wilderness. He left to his own company, to dwell in his own heartbreak, his own misery. And he left too to stay far away from Lucra, daughter of Aurithoc. She might have hoped, she might have imagined that with a rival gone, Elbrek would turn to her for lack of an alternative. But of course, he did not. How could he, when she had done that to Aoife? When she had shown her cruelty to all the world? Now Aoife dwelled in Mananon's country, and Edelbrecht wandered the roads and sang his sad songs. And Ogma watched the flight of cranes, Aoife and others like her. And he saw the shapes their bodies made against the sky and he began to notch into wood the letters of an alphabet inspired by their gracefulness. The cranes against the sky and the trees with their bare branches in the winter gave him the symbols of the Om alphabet. And Ilbrek wandered, and Mananon went about his business. And unbeknownst to Mananon, every now and then, Aoife flew from his protection, from his country, to the roads of Ireland, to seek out Ilbrek, to fly overhead, or to stand near him, hoping she might shine on him as she had in the old days, hoping that by her presence, even if he didn't recognise her, he might feel some comfort, some warmth of her regard, giving him what gift she could and trying to take contentment in being near him, in seeing him, hearing his voice and smelling his skin although it was far less than she had once desired 
It was the most that she could hope for now. And one day, Mananon MacLear decided to go hunting, as he often did. He rode out on his white horse that could go as easily over land as it could over sea. And he came to Ireland. And on the shores of a lake called Carib, he saw a great crane flying overhead. Mananon is wise and his wisdom is deep as the ocean. But Mananon is thoughtless of his own power at times. Paying no heed to how high the waves may crash, how fierce the winds may blow. And Mananon does not always think before he acts. And so, in a moment of carelessness, he whirled his sling above his head and cast his stone at the great crane. And when he struck her, for he aimed true, Aoife cried out. And then he did know her. And then he ran to catch her. And Aoife, in his arms, died as a crane, as she lived. Now Mananon's grief and rage and self-recrimination was a storm and battered the shores of the island for three days and three nights. The winds howled with his anger. The waves crashed with his rage. And at last, at last the fury of the storm blew itself out and there was only the soft weeping of the skies as the light turned back into silver. And when one looked out from the coast, a cliff or a beach, the grey of the sea and the grey of the sky merged into one as Mananon mourned the death of Aoife. But then he decided he would not let her death be in vain. Careless as it had been, he would make something of the tragedy. He would make what use he could of this tragedy. And so he took Aoife's skin and he made from it a bag. And he called it the Korvolog, the crane bag. And into that bag, he put all of his treasures. His shirt and his knife. The belt and the hook of Gobnu the smith. The letters of Agma, of that alphabet that he had made by watching the cranes fly against the sky and watching the branches of the trees in the winter. And any treasures he came across he put in there. The shears of the King of Alwyn. The helmet of the King of Lachlan. The skin of the Great Whale. The bones of the magical pig of Ossel. All of these and more he stored in the crane bag. And when he was finished with this great making, he had a magical treasure in its own right. Now it is said that through the years the crane bag passed from hand to hand, as Mananon did not always keep it. He gave it into the keeping of a chieftain named Leah, who was killed by Fionn Macool. The crane bag came into the possession of the Fianna, where it was known as a great treasure, that anyone who owned the crane bag only had to think of what they needed and reach into it and they would pull it out. But it is said that eventually the crane bag came back to Mananon MacLear and he brought it back to his home in the ocean. 
and it is the crane bag that holds now all the bounty, all the treasures of the sea. But like the sea, it is inconstant. And at high tide opens wide, and all the treasures can be seen. All that the sea gives and all that the sea has taken. Everything ever lost at sea is in there. And at ebb tide, the bag closes again, keeping its secrets, keeping its treasures. The bounty and the generosity of the ocean. The trickery of Mananon McLear. And the cruelty of showing what cannot be touched.